Like this is a great like a turn of phrase from the article I got it from. He became known as an enthusiastic bash artist. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome along to the Community Notice Board. Ready? Yep. You ready to go? God, fuck, we're bombing already. <laughs> <laughs> we can't even get a laugh amongst ourselves. <laughs> you wouldn't think we're free friends. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. This is. No, let's do it. All right, 40 minute episode. Let's go. Hello. <laughs> welcome to another episode of Community Notice Board, a podcast about suburbs we grew up in. Local landmarks, hometown heroes, and coming of age tales. It's just the three kings this week. And we are going. Don't stop listening. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, please. Give hold us on, a chance. <laughs> I mean, there might be a special guest. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, reset that dial, baby, because it's the three of us. We're riff. No, we're not ripping. We're <laughs> reading off a piece of paper. <laughs> yeah, we're, in boring time. Uh, we're doing it again, baby. You might know us from our famous King's Cross Underbelly episode mm -hmm. where we talked about true crime figures and we figured, how can we do this again? And we decided uh, Melbourne has a Melbourne. gangland scene, a huge gangland scene. I mean, Melbourne was the um, the site of the first Underbelly TV series. That's correct, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll get in, into that story. Yeah, sure. so Melbourne as well has its own seedy Underbelly. So we're here to explore it by copying and pasting news articles from news.com.au mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. hoping that makes a good tale in lieu of reading <laughs> don't long give books. The, don't give away the game. <laughs> <laughs> pulling the curtain back on, on my process. <laughs> so much stuff on mine where it was just like and if you're really interested you can listen to a 10 part podcast series I was like I don't think so well, you can I'm get gonna, that into a third of one yeah, actually yeah. <laughs> I was like I'm going to sevennow.com.au <laughs> and I'm not gonna attribute it to anybody, anybody absolutely <laughs> so we're going Melbourne wide um, Melbourne wide criminality timeline and what do you think wide. like do you I think Melbourne, I think Melbourne, Melbourne, uh, Melbourne criminal is a little more story based. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to say that name for so long. I was like, yeah, the Sydney, Sydney, Sydney criminals, they're sharp and to the point. Bang, bang. Yeah. Um, Melbourne, they like, more to, whimsical, they like to torture you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's Reserve My Dogs. It's a, it's a, it's a solo yeah, show. Exactly. It's a one man show. <laughs> So, yeah, Melbourne has its own, obviously, criminal underbelly. I assume every state does, and we will get to them all. I mean, South Australia is going to be a fucking hot one when we get to that. Mm, like yeah, totally. Well, Snowtown murders. Oh, right, like, That's okay. a huge thing. I guess I murders in general, not underbelly. But, uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah. But that, that well, they were a bit of a gang, were they? Yeah, well, they, I think it was. Adelaide's got a really interesting one with the... Um, uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, no. Selling this Melbourne app. <laughs> no, I'm just about... This, but this is real... But the, it's one of those like the family and it's fucking high ranking mm. lawyers and shit. But it's like I've heard that or saw yeah. that. I mean, Melbourne's got a ton, and we could do, and we will threaten to do multiple episodes. <laughs> yeah, if you guys it. don't like this one enough, we'll just do four more. <laughs> <until we're doing. laughs> Wait till you hear the even drier version. <laughs> but we're going Melbourne, and we're doing it. Kings, uh, the style we did in Kings Cross, we're going to go chronologically. So we're going to go with Al, me, and then Drew. We're going to go mm. around and mm -hmm. do some information, some of our famous riffs and bits, <laughs> maybe Classic. a little bit of injecting our personal lives in there too. Ooh. The cheeky three. Fuck. We're trying to get that started for a while. <laughs> what, bringing the nickname of your penis to the group of the podcast? <laughs> that is generous. Oh, wow. Okay. So, uh, Al, let's start with you. What you Man. got for us today? Well, because we were doing Underbelly, and um, I was like, okay, Underbelly, I think we've covered um, – oh, we haven't touched on any of the Underbelly. But, I, I mean, I saw the Underbelly the first show with the yeah. Vince Cosmo mm -hmm. and – Big shock, um, you know, death at the start. But I was it's on the Wikipedia. It's got all the clans, you know, the Carlton crew, and I think you guys yep. covering some of this stuff. But yep. then it had the Honored Society, and I was like, "Ooh, that sounds pretty cool." And uh, so the honor, and we just talked about this a little bit on the app um, with Mister Lokash um, about um, Sicily, about the Sicilian Mafia and and the um, Calabrian. Mafia, but it's not mm -hmm. the mafia. Is the and I'm gonna. I don't even know how to and pronounce drangheta, it. Drangheta. Yeah, I don't think you pronounce the end. So it's like drangheta. Drangheta. Dr drangheta, which is like Get this that word out of there. Then <laughs> stupidest <laughs> word. Okay. I'm not gonna isolate that clip. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's so a the drangheta, and then and it's basically the mafia from Italy, but it's not Sicilian mafia. Yeah, and yeah. I think Lokash said it's the 
It's the boot. It's the boot. It's, so it's, it's the across the across the way. Across, across the, the way, way. Um, and there's sort of three. Yeah, in Italy, there's three organized crime: the big dogs, and it's the the Costa Nostra. Costa Nostra. Costa, that's the mafia, and then the Drangheta, and then there's another one which I can't remember, and that doesn't matter. So I don't need to bring that up. But there's <laughs> a third that's pretty big. But these guys, um, basically, uh, in the twenties, um, there was a ship, you know, ship. Uh, bunch of Italians got on, landed in Adelaide, and they had a couple of blokes who were sort of hanging around this gang. And I think you touched on it in that episode, is that the, the, so the, the reason why that there's sort of this organised crime in these areas in Italy was the areas were like, um, they sort of stuck out in the Mediterranean and kept getting invaded by every single force. So there was no real government there. This is before unified Italy. Yeah. So there was like, oh, great, the Greeks are running the show and then there's these guys and there's all these like foreign powers. And so no, there was no like political stability and there was no proper police force. Yeah. And so the police force was effectively, I'm going to pay my mate to make sure my bookshop doesn't get, yeah. you know, yeah. robbed. And that became, all right, well, now he's got a, bunch of clients and now he's like well you know if you don't i'm gonna bash you and yep. you know so it sort of grows out of that so everyone sort of that's sort of ingrained and it's almost they basically call it a second government or the government is these families so um they they turn up and they start setting up some cells across you know like little little groups in melbourne perth sydney and uh they they, they actually start getting a bit of run in queensland um, in the fruit and vegetable industry, they know that they know how like farming and stuff like that. They've mm. got a lot, and a lot of the Italians coming over would just work in the farms, so they would inject themselves into those um, things, and it would be very similar. It would be like, how how about I protect your crops? Well, I don't need protection. Well, I'm going to burn them down. Yeah. It is me. interesting to see like huge crime families with like the most convoluted stories, they all start from people being like, well, I'm going to fucking bash your cunt. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, 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 yeah. It's like, it's if you very, don't do something, simple. I'll, ba- I'll dack you. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's going to see your little pecker. <laughs> How'd you like that? And then all of a sudden, it's like, you know, Godfather music yeah, yeah, and like yeah. murders in public and stuff. The Dacretas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Sicilian dark mafia. <laughs> it's like, I did not want my penis to be seen. <laughs> It's so small. Uh, so eventually um, they start, like a lot of Italians start coming into Melbourne and that's just like obviously one, um, a lot of um, uh, a lot of them getting into the fruit and vegetable markets and they're sort of, um, and a lot of people are coming over from that from that area and so they're, you know, used to it, um, the, the organised crime and it starts growing in Melbourne especially. So there's a lot of markets and stuff like that there. Um, and basically a few things happen. The Italian, like, uh, sorry, the Australian cops have no idea what's going on. And the, the, the Drangheta is actually really good at staying under the radar. Like mafia in America and Sicilian mafia are, are really headlines. And you guys have got some criminals who are like in the news. Mm, yeah. These guys are really good at staying under the radar. So for ages, they're operating in Melbourne in the markets, just extorting, getting a bit of this, bit of kickbacks. And the cops have no idea. And the cops start – there's two things that happen. The cops start going, what the hell's going on here? Firstly um, – A spate of dackings. <laughs> <laughs> um, but firstly, there's like uh, a bunch of Italians just start dying. Like they're mm-hmm. like, we got – a lot of Italians are dying recently, <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, so literally they were like, why are so many Italians dying? Like, what are these Italian murders, like murders mm. that are happening? The cops are like, that's mm, a little bit sus. This but then has been dacked to yeah. death. <laughs> um, yeah, they're, they're, they're testing, did you get dacked before or after the murder? Like, yeah. <laughs> But uh, in, fi- in 1957, um, someone tips them off that there's like a big meeting going down in Brunswick at this house. You should go down and check it out so the cops bust in and there's like 30 italian guys in there a lot of them carrying weapons knives just having a meeting the cops like what the hell's going on here and they're like we're here to celebrate little Susie's first birthday party and they're like where's little Susie?" and they're like oh well we sent her away <laughs> so the cops are like this is a little suspicious so there's 30 italian men and all the wives have been sent away but they're here to celebrate so and they're like and they're carrying weapons yeah they're called birthday. knives and pistols so the cops are like okay this is weird what's going on so they sent out um a report they got an american guy usda officer kuzak and a um collaborative pro- police chief um uh, marcera to come to australia and do a report and they basically just had this scathing report they're like you guys 
you have no idea what's going like this society in Melbourne is like taken over and you're under your, like you do not know what's going on like they're saying like you've got an Italian infestation you've got it yeah, yeah it's rent a kill of come there <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yeah, they've yeah. knocked on the walls and like you better start doing something about this gonna fucking explode. look at this there's fucking ragu <laughs> in the wall <laughs> yeah. you, late at night you turn your light on the Italians <laughs> <laughs> they're all out of the Mama kitchen yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, so they they just have this scathing rule that just says that, that like they've integrated in the fruit and vegetable industries what's next is they're going to get into wholesale distribution they're going to get an importation they're going to get their hands and everything. They're going to be in the pantry, you know. <laughs> so, you know <laughs> night club, for those traps. Yeah, yeah, night, yeah. Nightclubs, taverns, and everything. They're just going to get – this is how they're going to do it because we've seen it in America. This is what they do. And the, the cops are like, oh, we don't really have the resources. And the cops basically come out and say they, – they bury the report. They just go, we don't know what to do about this, so we're just not going to do anything about it. Yeah. So it just let's li- literally sits there, and that was in the 50s. For the next 30 years, it sort of plays out – by its own, but there's um, there's a couple of other things that happen, and no one really knows about it at the time, but it, they report on it later. But there was one again; it's all the same as all these things. There's a big boss, the Pope Italiano, his name is not the actual Pope, but <laughs> Domenico. It goes right to the top, you know. Yeah. Um, but he dies just of natural death, and then his successor. Um, Antonio the Toad Barber. The toad. Which is, I love Antonio the Toad. That's like a like a footy nickname for someone, <laughs> yeah. you know. Old Toady. Um, but he dies of natural causes within like a couple of weeks. I'm just and picturing Toady Rebecca now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Toady Radaki. Uh, so he dies, and then there's a power vacuum at the top, right? And um, there's two guys. There's Domenico De Marte, and he arrived in Australia at age 17 and joined the society and worked his way up. And then there's Vincenzo Muratore. He arrived like in his thirties. He'd already been in the, 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 the Greta in, it, in Italy and he comes in and they're like, Oh, this is like, you've only just turned up, but he's like, oh, I'm fucking, I know my shit. I've been around. So they have a bit of a fucking b- back and forth. And, um, Demartis starts like taking him to task and like embarrassing him and in fact in one meeting like stabs him to like show you need to like that would be embarrassing yeah yeah <laughs> stabbed ah, in a meeting. Fuck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. man come on um, where's my face red yeah <laughs> and so, my stomach too yeah. I've been stabbed. my pants <laughs> which are on the floor and my ankles <laughs> <laughs> my penis getting covered in blood <laughs> So Demade gets um, put as the leader, but uh, but uh, um, Anglietta he starts his own society, his own faction. Because I oh, fuck this guy, stab me, you know, <laughs> I'm not happy. Yeah. So he starts um, La Barastada, which is the bastard society, which so I think is cool. fucking cool. Yeah. So he starts, he gets up to 300 members in his peak. Right, so he's got this own little splinter org. He's not is, paying. Is he the seventeen-year-old or the thirty? He's the thirty-five-year-old yeah. one. Okay, yeah. So like that's when they came to Australia. They're both like fifty, sort yeah. of forty-five, but. Um, that he's a bit older and he's very Italian. So he's, um, aggressively Italian, <laughs> very aggressively Italian. So he's like, um, uh, he's got his own splinter thing. He's not paying up. He's not paying up to the, to the top. And he's, and he's, in, he's, um, challenging the authority and they don't know what to do about it. And, uh, so Demate's like, all right, we've got to do something about this. Um, so, uh, he goes to the Australian Crimene, which is like a board of directors that's been set up by the, the Greta in Australia to like keep watch over the operations. And apparently this is still today. It's like the five families in New York, yep. you know, that the commission. Yep. Yep. So it's that and they just sit there and um, and so he goes, basically I need permission to knock this guy off. Yep. And they go, all right, this is the only way to do it. So, yep, you've got your, you've got your wish, you can knock him off. And so Anglieta, he's uh, driving out of his driveway, 1963, um, so he's driving home, and when he's parking, two shotgun blasts through the rear car door, dead. Sh- right. Shoots him dead. So that and that was the first like murder that'd been in a while. So it's sort of been a couple of years of a bit of peace, but then there's this murder, um, and then but La Barastada that are not happy, and they're like, "This is bullshit." So they're like, "We got to fucking get our own back." So then they go a couple of months later. Shotgun blast and Marta in his driveway. It's just driveway stuff happening. Bang! So he so he gets shot. He doesn't die. He's all seriously wounded, but he refuses to cooperate cooperate with the investigators. And he's like, "Ah, oh, listen, I'm going to retire." You know, I feel like I, I can smell where this is going. Mm-hmm. So he retires. Um, and but they're not happy because they didn't kill anyone. Yeah. So they're like, "We got to kill the next guy as well." So the next guy, Vincendo Murat- Muratore. 
he's like, all right, I'm in the hot hot seat yeah, now. And then they're just that's like, a promotion you don't yeah, want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> the really? worst possible yeah, time. Like, actually, I'm kind of unperforming. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Not that good. I'm pretty bad. I actually. can't even dack a guy. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to undo a belt. So he goes, uh, he gets shot um, in his driveway again, and he's dead. And then the, the, the bastards are like, all right, we've fucking done our done our thing so uh eventually this guy ben v- ben venueto takes over and he's a bit of column a combo he's sort of on both sides he's a bit of consensus pick and he unites the society and so there's a bit of drama they're called the market murders three two sh- murders and an a, and a attempted murder in a couple of years and the cops are still stressing about this report but then um ben venueto takes over and uh calms everything down and he starts actually professionalizing a little bit the 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 society the cops are off their case a bit because they stop killing people but whatever so he starts uh they've got the fruit and veg market and it's very simple as i said you know you pay us and we'll take care of you and if you don't we'll, we'll you know fuck you over they start getting um they've got all these forklifts and logistical infrastructure and they he sets up and this is the second underbelly series which is the tale of two cities mm-hmm. Um, where in the city of Griffith in New South Wales, yeah, and I don't really know why Griffith, but apparently I think actually because there's a lot of heaps of Italians, in it, heaps of Italians for one, but there's also because it's all like farmland, they can just grow marijuana yep. unchecked, yep. so they're just growing shitloads of weed out there, and um, they with all their fruit and veggie forklifts and trucks and stuff, they just like bring it into Melbourne and Sydney selling it pretty much no one really cares no one's really watching except for that one poor cunt what was his name the politician they knocked off oh well that yeah yeah so that's this that's a guy um don don mackie i'll talk about him in a minute so he so the other thing is that they're um because there's a lot of work involved and they need people on the in they and they're very insular they don't br- they don't bring people in you can't get patched over they want col- you know, um, yeah, guys assume from the, it, you can't get like an Aussie. Bat not not even right. other Italians. Only from that area do they yeah, want. Yeah. In, you know, bre- um, so families marry each other. You're in the society. You're not even, you know, um, you got a choice. And yeah, no Aussie battlers. No, not even Greeks or Italians. So they need Italian foot soldiers. And there's a lot of Italians trying to come over here with a bit of history in that um, in the in the organised crime and the Australian. Um, they they just dismantle the white Australia policy, but they're very skeptical. So the the immigration minister is knocking back a bunch of people. It's like you you've know, got all these organised um, crime ties. Um, but uh, then Al Grasby, who gets elected, uh, he's the um, he becomes the immigration minister. Starts sort of like signing them all through. Turns out he's the local Griffiths like local electorate member, the division of River Rivina. So he's basically just like they're just paying him money, and he's like. You know what I mean? Yeah. Italiano criminale? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Like, yeah, sure. Whatever. You know? So he, they start flooding in all these Don Italian- Kiluminati. <laughs> <laughs> Dacaruno? Okay. Bit concerned there, but sure. So he Penis starts coming. Penis Ezio Exposerini? <laughs> D- Dacaruno. <laughs> Man, so glad we can be racist to Italian still. That's like, <laughs> wow, <laughs> we've got a Lacasio pass. That's true. That's absolutely true. <laughs> so he, they start getting all these. And then this Don Mackey, he's. In the Griffiths area, he's like, I'm. Everyone's growing weed out here. There's all this bullshit going on. He starts campaigning. He he goes in and tries to get elected into um, Grasby's electorate. Doesn't win, but he's like agitating and all this sorts of stuff. And also, he's um. Uh, there was a uh, he snitches to the cops about to the Sydney drug detectives about all this weed, and it goes to trial. These guys get um uh, four guys get arrested for marijuana trade, and then it just gets leaked that he's the that Mackey is the uh, the source. Ouch! And then um, Don Mackey disappeared from uh, Hotel yeah. Car Park, nineteen seventy seven, never found again. So he's and it was the first ever political assassination in Australia. So um, yeah, they just and fucking knocked him off. To this day, never found him. Never found him. No, and it's th- implied, I think, in that Underbelly series. I remember watching. It's pretty heavily implied that. He's at, on some fucking orange grove somewhere, just like. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, they, like, like they, I think they did arrest someone, to, but they never found his body or really have any real clue how they were doing it. But basically, there's a little. So there's a little bit of murder. Sassiano wasn't his name. Sassiano. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they basically get a bit more violent, um, but 
it, they still have a bit of savvy. And uh, so basically they, they've got this monopoly on the fruit and veg in Melbourne. And so what they do is... so funny that it comes back to fruit and it's, veg, it's, like little market. It is shit. like the bulk of their income is that. And what they do is they've bribed a bunch of um, buyers in Coles and Woolies. Um, and, they, and they've bribed them and said, you have to buy from suppliers that we say are okay. And the buy and the those guys are like I guess that's fine, and then they go just the, these guys go to so they're not even buying selling fruit they've realised it's the suckers game to actually be involved mm. like that uh, so they go to then the suppliers and say if we don't say you're okay you the coals and bullies aren't buying you so you need to give us fifty cents for every box of fruit you sell or veggies you sell. And then the, 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 they go, fuck off, we're not doing that. And then they've got all this trade with Coles and then Coles all of a sudden don't buy their fruit. Yeah. And, the, and apparently they were, the Coles buyers would be like um, picking faults with it and be like, look at this tomato, it's fucking a little bit speck of dust on it. I'm not buying this shit. And it's like, there's fucking nothing wrong with it. Yeah. It's like, so then they start doing that, 50 cents a box. And they're doing that for years. And that's how they get all their money. So they're just, they're just going, we tell you the list of who to buy from. You give us money if we if you sell to Coles, and then they stand back, and they just the money comes in, and they make and apparently, um, like Coles admitted that they were basically like through that deal, everyone like Coles were basically given like tens of millions of dollars to the mafia, direct indirectly, but yep. it was just happening in 1989. So that was happening for 20 years, and it was just a thing. Everyone in Melbourne for from like 70 to 1990 was was paying 50 cents extra for, uh, you know, whatever. Wait, 90, so, like, just regular customers yeah, well, going to a Coles checkout are paying 50 cents? Effectively. Not, it didn't come up on the line items. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 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 I don't want to get dacked a bit of pay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but basically the price was higher. And so what happened was in 1989... But then, then couldn't you just go to, like, a regional Victoria town to buy the same thing? Yeah, something? yeah, but, I mean, like, Coles had such buying power, so it was the same price if you went to a regional town, but they were, like, it would have been a lot cheaper if they weren't involved, right? Yeah, right. So, um, the money was just going to these guys. So in 1989, a senior Coles Meyer executive noticed that like, despite there being like a glut of cauliflowers being produced that year, the company was still paying like a lot more money. He just looked at it and was like, what the fuck are we doing this for? Why, why are we? So he asked one of his trusted deputies, um, John Valisi Polis, to investigate. Um, he quickly found a system that was riddled with se secret payments and kickbacks. This guy was like looking into it. And then uh, so basically... Um, he like people started like in the Coles team started investigating all this shit, and uh, uh, people started receiving phone calls. Um, the wife of a Coles fruit and vegetable buyer received a call that she would be going to her husband's funeral within a week. Oh, and wow. then uh, in 1999, December 1999, um, Polis, um, the one who'd been asking all these questions, uh, heard a bell, his uh, doorbell ring, and it said, "Open the door, John." And then he cracked it open and it was blast with a shotgun. Fuck. And man. so he survived, but the company Coles had to relocate him and six other employees from fear was of their like lives. Coles is putting people in a wit sack. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Coles had to, they flew him overseas for a couple of weeks, paid oh, for fuck. it, and then they relocated him to Australia. Flew him overseas, he lands in Calabria. <laughs> 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 that fun is a boss. <laughs> Shaking the plane. Man. Get him. I bought stuff from Coles the other day. I didn't know I was contributing to the market. Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, and the whole time, this is uh, Ben Vento. He's the guy who's the, he's the consensus pick who was just running it like, you know, the boss of the bosses. Um, and, uh, but he, so this has gone on the whole time. He's got a daughter, Angela, right? She married Alfonso Miratore. He was the accountant guy who they killed really early on, right? Remember yeah. they shot one guy, he survived, and then they shot the second in command. Yep. And so he's, he had a son called Alfonso who married, um, uh, Benavento. And so he was like, it's just so fucking perfectly. It's like all old school mafia movie stuff. Cause he's like, really close if it's a son-in-law not the son and the son-in-law is very close with the father-in-law and the son's real jealous of the relationship oh, yeah, you know right. what i mean yep, yep. so he's being groomed as the next in line he's next in line and the son frank buenavento is real jelly beans about it so he's like come on you know i'm, I'm your son. <laughs> a great way for mafia to describe yeah he's pretty jelly beans about <laughs> it <laughs> so um so basically but before he can fully be groomed into the next in line um, uh, Buenavento just dies, and then there's a bit of a fucking vacuum again. And um, and Muratore, what he does two things wrong, right? 
he so he sort of gets rebuffed and they're like we're not going to put you in as the leader even though he thought it was the dying wish of his father-in-law to be as, as a leader um so he does two things one he goes i'm going to get these guys so he goes to coles of all places and sets up a meeting with coles about trying to circumvent the extortion and set up his own little spin-off thing yeah right so coles here and coles know about all the drama and they're like we've got to solve this right so they're like they set up they know they're dealing with the uh, you know um, like a bad guy still so they've got like security and yeah. all this fucking shit he so walks they, in he's like just in case we're bugged Turns the radio on. It's like welcome to Cold. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So he then um, he does that. He starts to set up this deal, but he also because his father in law died, he's like, well, I don't have to marry his stupid daughter anymore. So he starts cheating on his daughter. Oh no! And so that's the brother, the the sister of the Frank, who was really jealous about it all. And so he does these two things, and then so the no one knows exactly what contributed to it, but. A couple of months later, um, Miratore shot dead outside his Melbourne home, just like his old boy, um, literally in the driveway. Everyone's killed in the driveway here. Bang, shotgun, dead. So um, Coles, because they had started like trying to get out of this whole mafia racket that they were um, uh, you know, unintentionally involved in, then the guy who they were going, all right, maybe we've got a thing with this thing, guy's fucking dead. They freak out, and they're like, we got to do – we need to fucking solve this. So literally the CEOs – um, approach Frank Costa, who's like the biggest wholesaler who's being forced to be to pay this tax. And it's like, can we just like go to you? You do everything, don't pay them. And Costa's an Italian guy, and he's like, yeah, fine, what, fuck it. And so he took on the, the, the Draghetta and just stopped paying them. And then they were like, um, they basically said, all right, well, come on, like, can you keep paying us, you know? <laughs> and then they said, you have a choice. Uh, we'll, like, you can, um, uh, we either go. Uh, you can get a million dollars cash every year, and we go back to the old ways, or we'll shoot you. And he's like, "Fuck off!" And then they're like, "Come on, please!" And then <laughs> he's like, friend. "If you shoot me or anyone I know, I'm gonna like get come back at you guys like uh, fucking uh, a million times worse." Oh, it's got to be a movie. Yeah, and then basically, so then like Frank basically just like stares and down calls their bluff. Um, apparently, like someone um he got a heavy to go in and like fucking uh, accost another guy and just stared him down and then eventually that they just sort of moved on and he just took over the whole trade and he's that still is pretty big balls right because it's like yeah he's I like, don't yeah know shoot me and they're like well we we've done it before yeah. Yeah. like what stopped them this time that's what everyone's saying <laughs> and it doesn't really make sense they just really he just says i called their bluff and which is <laughs> not a bluff because they were doing it to <laughs> yeah, exactly he's like they're not gonna shoot people and it's like yeah, well, we've done it like four times already. So but I don't it, know. It sounds like he, like you say, he got a heavy or he got someone else. To I think he. Him I think a it's a little bit. He's got to like, be dodge, right? Like, I, I'm potentially, but the end of the story, which is to the the story today, is that he's just he's got a thing called Costa Group, and he's like it's worth a billion dollars, and he still controls most of the buying and selling within Coles yeah. and, and Woolies. But because all because of like he. Looked at the mafia and was like, eh, I bet you won't shoot me. Literally, he just got the backing of Coles. And I think, I don't know if it was the government or the cops or someone t like convinced the the the, the, the Greta to, all right, it's not worth it. Yeah. You just shoot this billionaire. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. so. I guess that would maybe bring down some heat. But it seems yeah. like there's a big, like, scenes missing chunk there it, where, it, it's, where the guy's like, how'd you pull that off? And he was like, just from my winning personality. Yeah, yeah. Uh, why are your hands covered in blood? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> why, why are my pants around my ankles? <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's it. Yeah, that, that's the Honoured Society, man. And then, so they're still, like, they're still involved. They're still around. But they were, like, they're the times that they have poked their head above the surface and, um, and being, you know, and a lot of it's come out, like, 20 years later. It's like, mm. here's the history of it all. There's so much more info. They're involved in so much other shit. But, like... They're it's they're definitely they're not in stuff. the Coles website's history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so and that, it ends in the eighties, um, as in like the well, the eighties to nineties, and that's sort of the start of the um, of the Underbelly series, right? Which is the yep. um, the uh, Carlton crew and stuff like that. So, what, yep. what do you? Who was next? Uh, my my guy is uh, Christopher Dale Flannery. My more popular, no, more popular. <laughs> Popularly known as Mr. Rentakill, mm. the uh, self appointed nickname he gave himself, suspected of killing 14 people as a hitman in Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, and then he himself mysteriously disappeared. So he was. 
born in Melbourne, went to like Brunswick State School and uh, boys school there, all in like the inner northern suburbs. And basically he got in trouble and had like problems with his family life. So he lived in a boy's home where- um, Never ends well. Yeah, no. boys. <laughs> yeah. Never have a boy's home. You're like fucking, yeah. That sounds boys, so innocent. as well. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A home for boys? In, your tw- <laughs> in the 20s, the boy's home, sick. <laughs> when you're six or seven, bad. But so like I said, he was in a cruel, abusive environment at the Morning Star Boy's Home, which I mean, the Morning Star is the devil. So mm. like, way to telegraph it, guys. <laughs> But it, it said, like, uh, he was suspected there. Beca- the ha- bell's above no, us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Satan's little helpers. <laughs> May as well call it the diddly farm. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. The not molesters, <laughs> little molesting farm. Uh, so he left school at the age of 14 to eventually become a notorious gangster. And then he got, like, in trouble... Early on, he was convicted of housebreaking and car stealing when he was 14. He was con- convicted of assaulting a police officer and carrying a firearm when he was 16. Then he finally got, like, really done uh, for rape uh, when he was 19. He got sentenced to four years in prison. In prison, he starts making a couple of connections, baby. Mm. Uh, he became... Work in the room. <laughs> and then, like, this is a great, like, a turn of phrase from the article I got it from. He became known as an enthusiastic bash artist. <laughs> <laughs> It's like there's some artistry to be (laughs) bashing. It's like a subway sandwich artist. (laughs) I'm a bash artist. And (laughs) soon he graduated to the role of contract killer. His first victim was believed to have been Melbourne lawyer Roger Wilson, who vanished without trace in February 1980. So basically, in February 1980. This guy, Roger Wilson, he's 33 years old. He's driving his Porsche home to his wife and three daughters, and he's going to... Um, Avoid the driveway, brother. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's going to um, St. Clemens Jersey Stud, which is kind of near Gippsland, and he's on the southeastern freeway near inner city of Richmond when he's pulled over by two detectives in an unmarked police car. But both the car and the detectives... They're fake. One of them is this guy, Christopher Flannery. The other is this guy called Kevin Weary Williams. And Kevin had earned the nickname because whenever anyone asked you, how you going? He'd go, ah, a bit weary. <laughs> <laughs> so he got called Weary. Sick. That's so great. basically the two guys impersonating coppers, they handcuffed the lawyer and they put him in the backseat of their car and drove off, left the Porsche on the roadside. And then they went to uh, Pack- Packenham in West Gippsland around 10 kilometers and they dragged Wilson from his car. And then basically Chris- Christopher Flannery shot him in the head. But the thing was, he's a young contract killer. He sucks at shooting. So he shoots this cunt in the head, doesn't kill him. Mate, I'm a bash artist, not a kill artist, okay? <laughs> yeah, it's hard to graduate from bash artist to kill artist. So he shoots him in the head. And it misses? or Misses, like gets him. And the guy's like, I'm bleeding from my head. And this makes Christopher Flannery so mad that he missed and that the guy's still like shot in the head it's kind of like you know in Austin Powers where Will Ferrell's character gets <laughs> sucked and he's like oh no I'm still alive I'm very badly burned yeah. this is exactly what happens because the guy's like oh my head has been shot oh my god it hurts and he starts like trying to army crawl like away and so Christopher Flannery he gets so mad and he pursues him and then basically keeps firing at him in the head until his entire gun clip is empty. Fuck it. He was like, right, well, I've got to fucking show this guy now. So he doesn't make it very far, but he is crawling on his hands and knees to try and get away Fuck. from him. So um And and do so why did they kidnap the lawyer though? Was he just like contract kill. Oh, so they don't. He just didn't get yeah. told why. There was no personal. So basically, yeah. uh, this guy, the solicitor, he was buried in a paddock, and then uh, they did a little housekeeping. They drove back to the porch. They drove it to Tullamarine Airport, and they left it in the long-term uh, okay. airport car park. Mm-hmm. And so they basically were like, "This guy's fucking done a runner. He's a he's got some bad deals going mm-hmm. on. You know, he's a, mm-hmm. he's absconded." Well, so when Wilson didn't return home, his wife goes to the police, and then. Wilson's occasional business partner, Mark Alfred Clarkson, told them he didn't know what had happened to his colleague, but he allegedly told an acquaintance later that Wilson was gone, disappeared, had done a bunk. It was a story that had appeal because the Porsche was found at the airport. So this business partner is like, yeah, he's done a runner. And the Porsche is there, so it kind of perpetuates. The breakthrough in the investigation was a tip 
that the conspicuous Porsche had been spotted in Richmond the day that Wilson had disappeared. And so basically the business partnership between this guy Clarkson, who had said that he had done a runner, and Wilson, the guy who did, it was strained. And Wilson allegedly owed a chunk of money to Clarkson, which wasn't paid in time for Clarkson to avoid bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. So he basically had to declare bankruptcy and he made his unhappiness uh, with Wilson crystal clear. And then basically... Police would later allege that Flannery and Williams were offered 35 grand to dispatch him. And then uh, this woman named Deborah Boundy enters the scene. She's a weary Williams' girlfriend. <laughs> He's weary. Yeah, I mean, Hi, I'm weary Williams' girlfriend. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> so basically, um, when Wilson. So basically, Wilson's disappearance, eventually people are like, maybe it wasn't a disappearance. Flannery and Williams get a bit nervous, and Flannery tells his mate, if they don't find him for a couple of years, there'll be nothing left to identify with him. But he's wrong. So media interest uh, prompt Flannery, uh, an, an unnamed woman he was having an affair with, Boundy and Williams, they all decide to leave Melbourne till the heat dies down. They go on a little vacation. They go to the Gold Coast. And then when media interest cools, Flannery returns to Melbourne. Uh, but Boundy and Weary Williams uh, decided on a slow trip back, taking in the sights of Western New South Wales on the way. And in Burke, basically they stop and Williams is caught for petty theft. He's caught by the cops and they go, hey, man, what's your name? And he goes, well, looks around, Christopher Flannery. Uh, bad move, basically, oh, no. because Flannery is already wanted in Sydney at that point for the questioning over the murder of a thug and pimp. So the police the come in and they're like, name in the world yeah, to do. Yeah, 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 his criminal associate. Uh, Ted Bundy. <laughs> yeah. My name. So basically the police, they call like another set of police in Sydney and they're like, hey, we've got a guy here that's like been pinged for a warrant of murder in Khan, Sydney. And so the homicide squad arrive in Burke and then they see the guy sitting in the interview room, like drumming his fingers. And they're like, wait a minute, that's not Christopher. That guy looks a lot more weary. Than <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like and he keeps saying he is too. So they fingerprint him just to make sure fingerprints don't match. So it says, realizing he was in a deep pickle, Williams decided belatedly to say quiet. But his girlfriend, Boundy, she was more talkative and she became the lead prosecution witness in the case against Flannery, Williams and Clarkson for conspiring to murder this solicitor. So because he stole a pack of gum in Burke, mm. they get Yeah, gum. and gave the wrong, and gave a bad oh name. Oh my God. So it's like, I, you could have been like, yeah, I'm b police badge, yeah. Burke, <laughs> gun <laughs> and Stolen taser. chewing gum. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Wrigley's. I'm Wrigley's. <laughs> we are your Wrigley's. <laughs> And so basically she became a lead witness. And so Flannery, where it says here, with his bad boy good looks, tattoos, and penchant for fashionable clothes, accessorized with just a little too much bling would make a perfect Instagram influencer today. A little bit of editorializing from this article. <laughs> but ba basically it says this is before social media, obviously. So your chances of exposure are kind of limited. You get like a magazine spread or you appear on one of the nightly current affairs shows. And that is exactly what Christopher Flannery did. He goes on the top rating Mike Willisy show to brag about how he's a criminal. Wow. So he's an influencer now. Yeah. So it says like, like William. Early, um, early Chopper Reed style. Yeah, now. exactly. Wow. So he goes on TV and it's just like, yeah, I fucking kill people, dude. It rocks. And that's a bad move too. That is it a turns shocking out. move. Like, <laughs> in all the moves you can do yeah. as a criminal, yeah. going so on TV. And like, you'd think that that would immediately, like, you go on TV and you're like, I'm a fucking criminal. The police would immediately descend on you. That doesn't happen. Yeah, if here. there's one thing that's a running theme of this podcast is that the police don't want to do any work no. if they can help it. <laughs> no. And they don't. Yeah. But so, like, he he's on the he's on TV basically, and. Uh, his appearance, because he's got all these tattoos and he's got all this bling, it triggers a memory for um, the dead solicitor's farm manager, Terence Crompton. Yeah, so the dead solicitor is still not dead. Yeah, he's yeah. crawling <laughs> down the side yeah. from packing him. <laughs> Turns on the telly. Like, That's that fucking guy. I have, I have 32 bullets in me. Uh, so basically the farm manager recalls that uh, Flannery had been snooping around the farm prior to the disappearance disappearance oh. and when like called on it by crompton he said oh i'm a real estate agent i'm interested in buying the place and the guy's like hey, you don't look much like a real estate agent like 
not enough of a cunt. <laughs> He's yeah. just like, yeah, convicted murder. So this guy contacts the police, and police in 1980 believe they have sufficient evidence to charge Flannery, Clarkson, and Williams for the murder of this solicitor, Roger Wilson. Uh, police officers who tried to arrest Flannery had an unwelcome surprise when he pulled a small weapon from his undies. <laughs> <laughs> a pistol. <Wow. laughs> <laughs> no, it's always an unwelcome surprise. Yeah. Anyway. Don't mind pulling a small weapon from my <laughs> underpants. But uh, he was swiftly disarmed. And then um, in the lead up to his so arrest. Who, sorry, who did he pull it on the cops? That were he pulled it. Him? Like the cops come and arrest him. He's like, all right, I'm going to show you something. And they're like, oh, a micro penis. And he's like, no, it's a gun. And they're like, oh, that's worse. And um, so in the lead up to the arrest, Flannery, he's, uh, he's already described as a bit of a paranoid bloke. And then he says he's getting increasingly worried that police were going to find the body of this solicitor that they'd buried. So Mm, knowing that it's tricky to prosecute a murder case if the body hasn't been found, Flannery tried to get two of his his cronies from St Kilda's disco where he'd been a doorman to dig up Wilson and relocate oh, the remains. God. And so one of and the he got di- Mike Willisy to come cover it for <laughs> <laughs> his program. One of the diggers uh, was named Alphonse Gangatano, who yeah. eventually went on to become <laughs> got waved by immigration into the country. <laughs> <laughs> Gangatano, yeah. that's fine. Murderini gang affiliation. <laughs> but uh, he that, went on to have like a huge career in the Melbourne underworld as part of the Carlton crew. Yeah, yeah, isn't yeah. that um isn't that that's Vince, Vince Clossimo? Clossimo. Yeah, 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 yeah. The black. So of, basically, um, Gangatano, yeah. uh, he bragged to his criminal crew that uh, like exhuming this body was the worst thing he had to do. So he's like fucking at the pub, just being like, "Oh man, I had to dig up this body. Wouldn't you believe it? Pu, you know." <laughs> and uh, so basically, at the at the coroner's hearing, uh, bound then this woman Boundy, who was where Williams' girlfriend, who became a state's witness. She retracted just about like every useful piece of evidence she'd given to the police. And then also for good measure says that police assaulted her and fabricated her statement and forged her signature. And so she gets charged for perjury. Um, Flannery and his colleagues, they go to trial but claimed innocence. And then Boundy, the state's witness turned tight-lipped person, she goes missing on Christmas Day. Mm. Body never found. Wow, really? So even though she... Re- recanted. She recanted, but it was too late at that point. So they ran what they everyone reckons, but they don't know for sure that Gangatano did her in as well, basically. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And fuck, saying basically too much, hey. But uh so again, body's missing, lead witness is missing. And There's, is Flannery out like out and about or he's he's in jail? He's in jail, yeah. Yeah, okay. And so Jury deliberates for 14 hours. They find Clarkson, Flannery, Williams, not guilty. Mm. Flannery walks free from court, immediately arrested and extradited to Sydney for the murder of that pimp that I mentioned earlier. Mm. Wow. Uh, this guy was murdered in Menai in Sydney South, and he went on trial again, and the jury couldn't reach a verdict, verdict so the case was adjourned for two years. And they said that... <laughs> There's, there's a book that was written called Crime in the Digital, Digital Age that said when the trial was due to start, there was a GP called Jeffrey Edelston um, hey, who's come yeah. up before in yeah. our podcast. Yeah. And he gave Flannery a medical certificate deeming him too unwell to stand trial That's right. so he could avoid a judge. That's so he got, a sick, no- so he got mm. a sick note like, sorry, guys, Anthony can't come to court today yeah. to stand trial. He's got a tummy ache. Mm. And so... Obviously, Edelson, we've covered before, he was jailed for a year for perverting the course of justice, and he also hired Flannery to assault a former patient of his, and Flannery gets acquitted of this murder in Sydney. So he's in Melbourne, he's married with children, and it's like, fuck it, I'm moving to Sydney, baby, I'm going to become a bodyguard there. And then he became a part of the gang wars in Sydney, and he was embroiled in the attempted murder of undercover cop Michael Drury, those who knew him said he always struggled to control aggressive and violent urges. And then there's a book written by a guy named Darren Goodsir called Line of Fire. And he said that basically Mr. Drury had charged Flannery's friend, Alan, Alan Williams, after an undercover drug raid. So Flannery tries to bribe Drury. Be like, hey, get my friend off, brother. And he goes through another person we've mentioned in this podcast before. His middleman is crooked cop Roger Rogerson, Mm. and he tries to get him to drop the charges, but the officer refuses. So um, that's 
in Blue Murder, I think that's a scene where he sh- pops him through the window of yes, his house. Yes, it's a famous scene where he pops him through the window of his house. So Williams, the guy who's been done, gives Flannery and Rogerson $50,000 each to kill Drury, and they shoot him <coughs> and drive by at his house. He was shot twice through the kitchen window, and he survives. He's in a coma for almost two weeks, and when he got up, he had a strong suspicion of who tried to kill him. Imagine being in a coma for two weeks and being like, fuck. I know who killed me. <laughs> My boss, Roger Rogers. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the failed killing, it brought enormous heat down on heaps of people, especially Roger Rogerson, because he's got all this crooked cop shit going on. And so Flannery kind of becomes a star on the wane, basically. Right. You know, he's he's not no yesterday's news. He's not the hot kid in town anymore. Yeah. He's made a yeah. few too many fuck. It's like Todd Carney for the Raiders, yeah. you know. <laughs> few too many incidents pissing in your own mouth yeah, and you get shipped off to a different mm-hmm. team. And so he, he was at war with an underworld strongman, Tom Domican, and they were trading uh, drive-by shootings and lashing out with unnecessary aggression at the wrong people. In 1985, associate Tony Spaghetti Eustace. <laughs> great. A second great nickname. Well, that was his nickname. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I that was his No, no. It was, it, was his given, his it was his name. given middle name. Uh, he was shot dead in the Sydney suburb of North Arncliffe. Two children found Eustace dead beside his gold Mercedes. Flannery is thought to have been the culprit, but Eustace was famously, famously uncooperative with his dying words. So the police come to him and are like, hey, man, who do you think did it? And he goes... Fuck off and dies. Oh, shit. Pretty cool. 16 days later, Flannery himself disappears on a on his way to a meeting with a boss called his boss, George Freeman. His car wouldn't start, so Flannery calls his boss, and he's like, hey, mate, I can't make the meeting. My car won't start. Flannery's boss, George Freeman, says, well, why don't you take a cab? That's the last known contact anyone has of Mr. Rent-A-Kill. A coroner investigating the death in 1997 found that uh, he was the likely victim of murder and believed that Roger Rogerson had the information on it. The Crooked Cop told Current Affairs Program Sunday that Flannery was a complete pest and didn't do what he told, but now it's been three decades. No one has conclusive evidence of what happened to him. The last thing anyone knows is that he disappeared going in the cab. The popular theory is that he was lured to Freeman's place to check out a machine gun. So people are like, hey, man, come over to my place, check out this machine gun. Yeah. And then he goes missing think, and nothing yeah, ever is happens. Is there something down the barrel? Just <laughs> like, <laughs> could you look real close? <laughs> Damn, and that's the story that, that's of Mr. Rentekill. Far out. The bash artist. The Christopher in. Flannery, links with your guy. Yeah, well, I mean, they all kind of, there's intersections with a bunch of these people. Um, at least you guys have some funny nicknames like... Tony Baked Z D. Well, when you you know, when ours reading out his names, I'm like, thank fuck I've got Carl Williams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't have to struggle around with an Italian name. Yeah. Um but yeah, this is obviously Carl Williams, um, who more or less like kind of kicked off the infamous gangland war um in Melbourne, which um sort of late nineties and ended around maybe just over a decade later. Um, so, Carl, just a brief overview. He's born Melbourne, 1970, grows up in sort of northwest area around Broadmeadows. Um, he's got an older brother, Shane, who died of a heroin overdose in 97. Um, and he grows up, he gets married to a convicted tr- uh, drug trafficker, Roberta, um, with whom he has one daughter, Dakota Williams. She's born uh, 10th of March, 2001. And um, we'll get to those two later. Uh, he basically held various laboring jobs before he opened a children's clothing store <laughs> in partnership with his wife, which eventually failed. Um, and he had a bit of, like during this time, he had some scattered criminal history. 1990s, convicted of handling stolen goods, possession of stolen property, and failing to answer bail, um, fined 400 bucks. Then, 93, convicted of criminal damage and throwing a missile. Um, sentence. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's kind of like an ICMCB. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> chucking it. Um, sentenced to 150 hours of community service there. And then 94, he was convicted of attempting to traffic in a drug of dependence and was sentenced to 12 months um, jail, six months suspended. Uh, and then in 1999, uh, Williams, along with his father, George, and another associate, were arrested and charged with uh, drug trafficking after a raid on a drug factory that had been set up uh, in a unit in Broadmeadows. They had more than 25,000 amphetamine tablets. And it's mm. like, they're producing the drug on site. Get a fucking house. Get a detached house. What are they in a unit? They're in a unit. unit. Yeah, like, <laughs> you know, it's coming up in the strata have... minutes a lot. <laughs> yeah. 12B, you've got a lot of fucking dodgy people <laughs> coming out. coming out front of the door. That's crazy. Um, 
and so yeah like i said he was pretty instrumental in this um melbourne drug uh gangland war which was like you know obviously we're all the same age growing up that was huge like that was in the papers every day it felt like yeah, yeah. i missed all of it because i came here in 1999 i don't think i paid uh, any well the attention. biggest well, part of it was it like was still going 2001 to 2000 sort of seven that, that was when it was all happening 11 at that point <laughs> <laughs> um never forget uh so the the gangland war basically a month before he was arrested in that unit block in Broadmeadows, he was shot in the stomach by jason moran um who was part of of the famous Moran crime family. Um, And this was over an $80,000 drug debt, as well as um, they had some issues with his supply. Apparently it was a bit dodgy. And there was an issue with his ownership of a pill press. There was some like scandal there. So he's producing for Moran to distribute. Yeah, and they're saying your stuff sucks. The Mitsubishi Um, logo is all wrong. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, 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 yeah. (laughs) a Datsun or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> You're putting a Hyundai on there again. <laughs> um, but also some people think that there was an issue with his wife, Roberta. Apparently he used to go out with like a Moran associate and then she mm. jumped ship to fucking Carl. Um, so a quote from the newspaper article that I read about the, this. So he shot in the stomach from um, Jason Moran. And I love this. It goes, uh, with a sore tummy, Mr. Williams <laughs> ventured onto his parents' place to celebrate his birthday. And then later that night went to hospital. So he's, he's kicking on. He parties <laughs> for Jeez. age, and then he's like, "I suppose I should go." I'm. I do have an open wound <laughs> in my take stomach. Take an and uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I also just love that they call it a sore tummy. Like he had fucking too much birthday cake. Um, and this kicks the gangland war into overdrive. It doesn't really start it. Like you can kind of trace that whole thing back to a, an arrest in '96 of this bloke John Higgs, who was Australia's number one trafficker of amphetamines. And you know we can't. There's not enough time in the day to go through that whole history. There's a lot of like crime history in Melbourne with the Painters and Dockers Union. Yeah. Especially that's the sort of Morans. They all were part of that union, which I think was more Irish. And then the Italian Drangheta came in. Um, uh, But ultimately the war ended up killing directly 36 people over a period of just over a decade, which is like pretty huge. But also like, I don't know if like comparatively is that huge? Like, Mafia seems like I was thinking because you know, growing up, I was like, Man, this is crazy how many people are dying. And then you think, like, in New York, the mafia just knocked that out in a fucking weekend. Nah, I think that would be pretty big for the size of the city and yeah, stuff like true, that because it's like I feel like a lot of the other times it's like, and they're all like brazen, like shooting in the driveway stuff. It's oh, not like some of them just go missing, pretty egregious, yeah, yeah. So, in terms of like front page murder stuff, I feel like yeah. that's got to be a fucking. Yeah. It's got to right be up, up there. there. He, um, I just, I'll, we'll put up photos on the YouTube and like Google if you're listening. He's one of the funniest looking blokes you'll yeah. ever see. Like he looks like he'd belong at like one of my family barbecues <laughs> just with a fucking beer in hand. Like he just such an odd knockabout bloke. In 2002, he meets a hitman called um, Andrew Vinyamin, who nicknamed Benji, uh, and he meets him through Tony Mockbell. Mm. Classic. I love. I, don't, I think we've maybe yeah, brought him up before. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember what. Um, it, if you, the wig, the wig. I've, I've brought the photo along oh, just so we can so all. Good. Oh good. He's arrested in one of the worst rugs you'll ever see. So <laughs> give that like a he's go. trying to win a Burke Kreischer look <laughs> contest. <laughs> um, and Benji Vinyamin becomes his right hand man. Um, and this guy is like he's Carl's right hand man. Yes, yeah. and he's a very um adept killer. This bloke. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that happened until 2002. He, he uh, sorry, until 2004, I think. Um, he had a weird relationship with Carl's wife, um, Roberta. Which, if you watch Un- Underbelly season one, it's pretty much it's portrayed as a full on affair between those two. Um, but it's not really confirmed if that's you know sort of what happened or if they were just very close. Mm. But in 2009, she did claim that he was her soulmate. Right, nice. ben- Veneman. Yeah, so oh, make it that okay. way, Bill. Mm-hmm. Um, so here's a qu- just quick rundown of the beats in the gangland war as it relates to Williams. So June 15, 2000, Mark Moran, Jason Moran's half-brother, is shot dead outside his northwest Melbourne home. And this is all after Carl's shot in the stomach. This is, that's one year, one year after. Yep. Um, so Williams was charged with murder over this shooting, but charges were dropped when he pled guilty to three other killings. 
Um, <laughs> Not the smartest move, yeah. Carl. Classic. Yeah, classic technique. Yeah. Ah, like, I won't go down for this one. I'll go down for three more. The cop's like, I'll give you this tiny little $2 coin if you yeah. give me that big 50 cents. Um, in two, November 10, 20, 2001, so the year after, William's home in Hillside and his Mercedes Benz are damaged by shotgun blasts. Um, and he later testified that he believed the Morans were responsible for that one. June 21, 2003, Jason Moran and Pasquale Barbaro are gunned down while sitting in a van watching Moran's children play football. Fuck. Which this one's the worst fucking one. Um, basically, so they, they, these two blokes are in the front seat and the kids are in the back. There's five kids in the minivan. Uh, two of the kids were Moran's and all were age seven or under. And they literally just shotgun like straight in front of the kids, you know, b- fucking Blue brains dad, covering. Dad's brains out. Yeah, like it's pretty fucked up. Um, they wouldn't play footy that day. <laughs> <laughs> Um, August 18, 2003, the badly burnt body of Mark Malia, a close associate of murdered mob enforcer and drug dealer Nick Radev, uh, is found in a melted wheelie bin. Um, October 25, same year, drug dealer Michael Marshall gunned down in front of his son in South Yarra. Um, 2004, um, the Moran family patriarch Louis Moran, father of Jason, is shot dead execution style in the Brunswick Club in Melbourne. Um, 2004, police arrests two gunmen near the home of notorious gangster Mario Condello. Two years later, Mario Condello is shot dead in his driveway. Fuck. Driveway again. I fucking love this shit. Get rid of the driveway. Get rid of <laughs> <laughs> um, 2006. That would be the first thing I would do if I was a mafioso. <laughs> yeah. Just be like, I'm, I don't have a driveway. James parks on the curb right outside of the house. He's like, <laughs> well, they can't get me now. <laughs> the the gunmen yeah, are all confused. Yeah, the gunmen around there being like, I don't see it. <laughs> Um, 2006 in July 19, Williams pleads not guilty to the murder of Michael Marshall, but he's sentenced to 27 years over the killing. Um, the outcome of the trial is not revealed until, two, until 2007. Um, so in 2007, Williams pleads guilty to three counts of mur- murder over the deaths of Jason Moran, Mark Jason, Malia. I keep thinking you're saying Jason Moraz. Jason Moraz. <laughs> <laughs> Someone ought to take him out. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Louis Moran. So he gets done for those three and one count of conspiracy to murder Mario Condello. And he's sentenced to two terms of life imprisonment, given two 25-year jail sentences, all to be conser- uh, served concurrently with a minimum term of 35 years. So he's pretty much away for life mm-hmm. at this point. Um, and during this whole time, he's he's a ma- like a big deal just in the drug trade. Like he's getting more and more success. He's getting riches, but he's also doing the opposite of the draghetta, uh, just absolutely going around town, big noting himself. Yeah. Just any media he wants, like, you know, he's, he's just a hound for it. Um, and at one point he started referring to himself as the premier because he ran this state. It's <laughs> <laughs> just such a fucking <laughs> bogan thing to do. Um, I've also just, we'll put this up on the YouTube as well, but there's a photo of, this is him and um, Venuman, a couple of best buds. Oh, just yeah, there, you know, yeah, it's yeah. so weird to see like these family photos because they're just, Obviously, just a barbecue or something. It's just so weird that mm. he's responsible for all these deaths. Yeah, he doesn't look... He looks like he, he might have bashed someone once, but yeah. not like be taken out Yeah, 12 hits or whatever. Um, and he... Uh, so, yeah, he called himself the Premier. He described himself as a semi-professional gambler. <laughs> <laughs> no, aren't we all, man? Yeah. <laughs> On the right day. I'm more of an open mind gambler. <laughs> um, and he ended up being uh, banned from the Crown Casino in 2004 by Police Commissioner Christine Nixon under the Casino Control Act. Um, and so Why? Because uh, he was just a uh, was he, well, it's too criminal many features. <laughs> Uh, so this is a quote from his lawyer. This is a few, you know years later. He kept picking Findo instead of Mary <laughs> Money. And who, why wouldn't you? Um, the good crooks keep a low profile. They laugh all the way to the bank, even if they're using a false name. Running around calling yourself the premier and effectively calling press conferences is not the way to survive long term. <laughs> None of these people need to uh, needed to invest in superannuation. So you know he's throwing zingers out at, at him. Yeah, right. um, so that's his lawyer. Uh, so he's locked up in 2007 and that kind of effectively ends the worst of the, of the drug war, um, or, or sorry, the gangland war. Um, and then on the 19th of April, 2010, he is bashed to death. So he's got a head injury, um, in Barwon prison. He was struck in the head with part of an exercise bike by mm-hmm. another inmate, Matthew Johnson, who was, um, he was convicted of the murder and sentenced to 32 years in jail for it. 
Um, his funeral was held in uh, on the 30th of April, uh, St. Teresa's Catholic Church in Essendon, uh, where he was buried in a gold coffin. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> that rules. I just, he's got cashed up bogan energy like yeah, everything about him I, yeah. I, it's it's very tinkler if tinkler yeah was very he's tinkler. buried in an above ground hot tub <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, isn't that how dharma got killed to exercise equipment you know <coughs> yeah, dharma got so, killed yeah. by another yeah. thing yeah. Yeah, yeah um and then the next year in 2011 it was reported that um yeah his resting place is basically just a nameless plot without a headstone because they don't I guess just what people dig it up. Dig it up and get the gold <laughs> yeah. fucking coffin. You know, like pirates or whatever. I don't know where you fence a gold coffin. Yeah, yeah, like, that's know. not a huge market. I don't know. I literally just thought maybe we should do that. <laughs> just find the one like nameless plot in yeah. the cemetery. Yeah. Um, Use a metal detector. <laughs> the circumstances of his death that eventually got investigated by the Victorian Ombudsman um, and a report came out critical of Corrections Victoria for approving Williams to share a cell with Johnson was um, – this report was released in 2012, <clears throat> and two months later, uh, in June 2012, the Department of Justice Secretary uh, resigned, and earlier um, earlier that year in May, the Corrections Victoria Commissioner had resigned. Um, 2019, during the Royal, Royal Commission into the Management of Police Informants, former Deputy Commissioner for Victoria Police, Sir Kenneth Lloyd-Jones, made a written, written uh, submission stating his belief that prison staff were involved in the death. Mm. And... Um, I'll just repeat the commission into the management of police informants. Right. Because there's a huge revelation. The day of his death, a newspaper report came out in the Herald Sun, which revealed that Victoria police were paying eight grand a year in school fees for his daughter, Dakota. Oh. Massive scandal. Everyone's like, taxpayers are like, what the fuck? Mm. Um, and the reason it was not revealed at the time, but later during um, the uh, 2011 murder trial, like Carl's murder trial, um, it was revealed that he had turned informant and struck a deal. He was a fucking rat. He was a rat. Um, and he gave the Commissioner Simon Overland, Assistant Commissioner, sorry, information on uh, several unsolved murder cases believed to involve corrupt cops. Um, and it was also revealed that the guy who murdered him, Johnson, may have been implicated in at least one of those cases. So there's speculation that police agreed to pay the school fees in exchange for the information <coughs> and the publication of that story could have led directly to his death. Oh, like a, so that came out in the paper and then he was killed. Yeah. From the fire. The, the same day. Oh, damn. And so the cops, it sounded like, the, you know, the cops. This sounds like the, the cops took a hit out on him, kind yeah. of. Yeah. Like they were like, hey, we're just going to leave. We're just going to turn around and leave this exercise bike mm. thing here. And whatever happens, happens. Right, right, right. Because I thought, like, if the murderer kills a murderer in jail, you're like, it gives a shit. Yeah. You know, yeah why yeah. would you have a big thing? But if, it's, if it was an informant, that's. Um, whole different thing. And since then, um, his daughter and uh, and ex wife have um, they're both joined only only fans as you would. <laughs> um, re- mum first, then the daughter a week later. Damn. Um, God damn. School yeah, fans went to good years. <laughs> yeah. I, I kind of feel a bit sorry for Dakota because she's been like just targeted in the media since she was like nine years old. Mm. Um, but it kind of makes sense for her to do only fans because like. Um, she has 40,000 Instagram followers. You can turn that into money straight away. She's an attractive girl. Roberta, on the other hand, that she's a fucking head case, this lady. She's always trying to get easy money. Like, she's got a scam every other year. And she's, she's like Carl. She just loves media attention. There's, like, there's great videos of her, like, flipping chairs in a police, like, uh, interrogation Sick. room and shit. Um, after Carl was sentenced to his 35 years in 2007, she offered... <laughs> um, during the court, during the trial, she offered a snort of coke to the person sitting next to her in court, seemingly unaware he was a policeman's father. <laughs> so, so she's handing out key bumps while he's getting put away. Um, she also tried to market her notoriety with magazine articles, public appearances, and she did a crime tour. Um, and then most recently, the story with Fuck, her. Would this been after like Ralph disbanded? I feel like they would have been all over. Probably this. similar time. Yeah. Well, 2007, yeah, mm. they've still been around. Um, yeah, most recently, a journalist at The Age, this bloke, John Sylvester, got this email. So it says, John, I need to speak with you urgently and privately. I've been involved in uh, creating the Roberta Williams um, reality show until, <laughs> until two nights ago when I was almost murdered. It was minutes after my children and mother left the studio in Collingwood. I was tied up, beaten to an inch of my life, extorted, choked with an electrical extension lead and forced to make calls to my family members to transfer money to Roberta via the studio owner. Otherwise, I, as well as my mother and small children, would have holes in our heads 
I've been tossing up whether to contact police regarding this, but I'm holding off. I want to speak to someone trustworthy in the, in the pu- task force Purana, who I guess is the prime. Yep. Yeah. Um, there are many other things I could say, but being a non-secured email, I won't go into further details. Hoping to hear from you. Regards, Ryan. So that, this is um, a, f- directly from the uh, article that um, John Sylvester wrote. He goes, I contacted Ryan, who turned out to be would-be television producer Ryan Nomenko, who had planned a reality television program starring Roberta Williams. As Roberta was keen on money, but not so keen on regular employment, it was an attractive proposition. She would be paid just for being Roberta and her profile would again be on the rise. After all, she was bankrupt with assets of $2,022 sorry, $2, and debts of $405,759, oh, hey. including $24,000 in school fees, uh, $20,000 for a former husband's funeral and $26,000 to Centrelink. Um, at the funerals, <coughs> this was another great... Um, just a little aside, at the funeral, mourners were led in the front entrance, then out the back and around again to make it appear to be more of a packed crowd. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, done that one a couple of times before. It's the Trump inauguration. Yeah, power bomb's going off today. <laughs> um, meanwhile, the gold cross from the gold casket was stolen, as well as money from the priest's rectory. Jesus. <laughs> Someone robbed the priest at his funeral. Um, the, pl- the plan was to raise 50 grand through a GoFundMe page for the reality project. Um, proof that Roberta was no longer a fan favourite was the fact that the page rate raised $840. Oh, my God. Um, Nemeko oh. said he'd been lured to a Collingwood production house where over three hours he was tied up, beaten, pistol whipped, threatened with death until his father and sister handed over some cash. Uh, he's, this is a quote from Robert. Um, they told me I, I owed them 20 grand. They put my phone on speaker and rang my mother, father and sister to get money transferred. They made me talk to them and said, say anything wrong and we'll put one in you. Roberta kept screaming that they were going to kill me and the kids. Fucking hell. So then, yeah, she gets arrested for that. And that, I think that was the video where she's being interrogated and she starts fucking flipping the table and stuff. But here's another photo I'll, I'll, we can chuck up on the YouTube. I'll send these all to you, Al. Just a little family photo of, of Carl, Dakota, and, and Roberta. And just have a look. at <laughs> He's looking directly at the camera. He knows a photo's being taken. That's the face he goes with. <laughs> It looks like he's like a bullet is entering his brain. <laughs> he's the dopiest. Yeah. Thing was he in a driveway? Or something? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's our boy Damn, Carl. And that go. is our boy the episode. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well done. This is why oh, Jamie awesome. leads the pack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just the stumble over <laughs> names and places. Um, we Thanks probably, for listening. Yeah, there's no it. point doing the. No, no we don't question. need to do two questions. But we just need to plug the fucking pod, baby. And the t shirts and the reviews, baby. Yes, Apple Podcast and Spotify please give us five stars we've got a YouTube channel where we put the full video out please subscribe to that you can hit us up on all social media we love hearing from you and you can also buy t-shirts to, for our show on the Instagram send us a pic of you link. with the t-shirt yes on. please do that it, hey even with it off <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe we're just uh, on the bed. <laughs> um, but apart from that, man, what a fun episode! Yeah, we so learned a lot. And we'll be back next week with another bangaroony. <laughs> Catch. Catch us later. Bye. Bye.